Welcome to Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth and love ministry podcast designed to help biblical Christians witness to their Mormon friends, family, and missionaries. For more Bible-based resources, check out tilm.org. We have all kinds of resources to support you, including classes, witnessing scenarios, books, and so much more. Visit tilm.org today. friends, this is Molly and Mark. Welcome to Christ in the New Testament. This week we are studying Matthew 19 through 20, Mark 10, and Luke 18. And these three books of the Bible are called the Synoptic Gospels. They have a lot of similar stories and similar orders. So we'll be looking at those in picking and choosing which books to look at. But Mark, what are we going to focus on today? Yeah, so this is a time in Jesus' ministry where he is really challenging and confronting both his disciples as well as the greater crowds at large with many of his teachings. And the teachings that we're going to really see him focusing in on today are some that are going to help us understand what it really means to be righteous. Where does righteousness come from? He's going to contrast self-righteousness with humility, pride with humility. And so those are some of the bigger themes that we're going to see in these accounts. Uh, We're going to grab first um, a part of the account that is unique to Luke's gospel, and that's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And that'll hopefully kind of help us set the stage for some of the other conversations that Jesus has with his disciples and others in these few chapters. So we're turning to Luke chapter 18, and this is verse 9. And as we do with parables, can you give us a little bit of cultural background? So we've got two characters, Pharisee, tax collector. How did people generally view and see these types of people? Yeah, so even though we today might look at the Pharisees and say they were the bad guys, um, that was not the case in first century culture. They were esteemed by many. Um, They were praised by many because they were the good guys at that time, those that at least outwardly were following all of the rules and regulations and rituals. Even though they lorded that over the people and the people probably despised them for it, they were viewed pretty highly. And then the tax collectors were kind of the opposite. Nobody really liked them. They took their money and they gave it away to the Romans. And so the fact that Jesus pairs these two up, as he he does throughout the the scriptures, is quite fascinating. Often they are kind of two juxta, two, two different groups of people that are in this really unique juxtaposition throughout the Bible. Okay, so starting at verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you the truth. Well, it doesn't say that. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Lots to take a look at in this parable, but maybe the the first thing to really just unpack is the way in which this Pharisee presents himself at the temple. He, He goes there to pray, and this is not a private prayer. This is a very public prayer that he makes where he is comparing himself with other people, including a tax collector that he sees in the distance. And what we really notice in this prayer is it's not a prayer of supplication, and it's not really a proper prayer of thanksgiving, because he's not, pr- he's not thanking God for anything other than, well, himself. He thanks God not for the gifts that God has given him, but for the work that he is doing for God. And so he compares himself to kind of three 
big groups of people in their day that would have been considered the bad guys, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers. But they themselves, the Pharisees, they often fell into those same three bad guy categories. They were, in a sense, robbing from the people. They were evildoers themselves. And in the spiritual sense, they were also adulterers, but they failed to see this. And so they prided themselves, patted themselves on the back and compared themselves to others. And in this way, they were able to elevate themselves. It's kind of that comparison theology. God likes me because I am better than other people. And uh, it sounds ridiculous to think we're uh, saved or liked by God more because of comparison theology, but we do it all the time. Um, I was just realizing how much I fall into this category in that I'll think, oh God, I'm so glad I'm not like those other pharisaical religions. Or I'm so thankful I don't have an addiction problem. (laughs) And then here I am, I'm the Pharisee myself. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's really easy as we start to look at the sins of other people to fall into a, a Pharisaical attitude like this. Yeah, and he even goes on and he goes above and beyond. You know, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get, mm. uh, going above and beyond what was required and expected. So he really thinks he's doing it. He's got it together. He's earning what he needs to earn. Yeah, and this really, you know, is the point that Jesus is making. Luke opens this by saying, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Okay. Um, most parables don't have quite that clear of a setup. Um, many of them are a little bit harder to figure out exactly the point that Jesus is making, but the setup is the point. And so, yeah, we've we've looked at the the Pharisee, and now in contrast and in comparison is this humble tax collector who stands at the distance. He's not even looking up to heaven, but instead he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. In a few chapters, we're going to look at some stories of blind beggars that come to Jesus and say, Lord, have mercy on us, or God, have mercy on us. And they use a a different word for mercy. They use a more common word for mercy than the word that is used for mercy here. And some theologians have really drawn attention to the fact that what he is asking for isn't that that God would just have mercy on him, but it's a a Greek word that is the word hilastathy, which comes from the, the Greek word hilasterion, which is kind of a fascinating word in the New Testament because it's the word that is used to refer to the Old Testament atonement cover or mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And so in a sense, what he's really specifically doing is he's invoking this concept of the atonement or what's sometimes referred to as the propitiation of his sins. It's not just a request for pity or compassion on the part of this God that he's trusting in, but it's a plea to provide a means of reconciliation and forgiveness through the sacrifice of the atonement. So there's some big theology going on in this simple prayer that he prays. And so, And because the atonement cover is the lid of the ark, and it's over top of the law, the Ten Commandments, right? And so the significance is God looks down and sees the cover. He doesn't see the law. Yeah, and really what happens in the New Testament then is both Paul and the writer of Hebrews build on this idea of the hilasterion or the mercy seat, and they say that that's the thing that is going to help us understand the kind of relationship we have with God. Uh, The author of Hebrews repeatedly refers to the atonement or the mercy seat as a type or a symbol of Christ's atoning work on the cross, and therefore the, the tax collector's plea for mercy is a recognition of his need for atonement, And his use of this verb form really emphasizes the importance of a sacrifice in securing his forgiveness. So in contrast to the man, the other man, the Pharisee who thought it was his service and his work, he's saying, no, I I need a sacrifice here. So one of the phrases that I really love in this parable is went home justified. And I love it because it doesn't say the tax collector cleaned up his act And then he was justified. He was justified at that moment. 
Absolutely. And he goes home. And it's interesting that many of our modern translations use the word exalted um, here. And so for all those who exalt themselves will be humble. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Mm -hmm. Don't think Mormon exaltation here. Um, Think a different type of exaltation. So is there anything else I need to consider as I am sharing this with LDS friends? Do they have any different applications to be aware of? No, I, I don't think there's too many different applications. Maybe the thing to ask our Mormon friends is, which one of these are you? Um, which one are you? And just kind of let that sit there um, and think about how we can really show them we don't need to cover up our sin. We need to ask for our sin to be taken away from us. So all of our prideful ways of downplaying our sinfulness or elevating ourselves or comparing ourselves, those can be done away with, and we can just expose ourselves to the reality of our sinfulness. Always better to be crying out, Lord, have mercy. Um, Should we go to the next story? So this is Mark. We're going to move to Mark now. Uh, this would be chapter 10 and we are going to go to verse 17 and talk about the rich young man. So we'll start reading that as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. And you shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with the persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So the character in this story, the rich young man, he kind of reminds me of the the beginning of the Good Samaritan. Someone asks a similar question, what must I do to be saved? And here he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, what do you think about this this young man? What is he trying to figure out? What does he know? His char- general character study. Yeah, just the way in which he approaches Jesus, it's fascinating. He, he calls him good. Um, he acknowledges that there's something about this man that makes him more moral, perhaps, than other people. And then by him saying, what must I do? He's showing that he believes that there is something that he must do to inherit eternal life. And this, this is bothering him. Um, he feels that he has done all of the things, but he also senses that something is lacking in his work. And so he's coming, it appears both to Jesus as a fellow good man to maybe say, hey, how can we encourage each other in our goodness? But also maybe looking for a pat on the back. Maybe he's hoping that I'll say, no, you've, you've done all of these things. Jesus really confronts him in kind of a, a fascinating way, doesn't he? Where he says, well, why do you call me good? Uh, No one is good except for God alone. What's he doing there? Well, it's interesting because first you you have to uh, ponder what Jesus is actually saying. Either Jesus is saying that he himself is not good or Jesus is saying, I am God. 
And therefore, this man does not fit in, in that category. The rich young man is not good. Jesus is already saying that at the start. Yeah, and then Jesus builds on that by really drawing his attention to the commandments. In other places, the, the one Molly mentioned earlier about the man that came asking about what it takes to earn eternal life, Jesus really goes to what's sometimes referred to as the first table of the law, the first three mm-hmm. commandments. But here, he focuses in on the second table of the law, the things that man does with his fellow man. And he focuses on murder, adultery, stealing, false testimony, defrauding, honoring father and mother. And it's fascinating that this young man says, yep, done it. (laughs) Check, 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 check. How can someone convince themselves that they have kept all of those commandments? What, What does one have to do? To be able to say that. They have to ignore the Sermon on the Mount. And, and what I mean by that is they have to lower the law. Like you can't um, include lust as part of adultery. Um, you can't include um, po- uh, your thoughts as part of false testimony um, and uh, dishonoring your father and mother. You really have to lower the law. Um, it reminds me of the Pharisee that we, we just read about, the... Um, his uh, rap sheet that he gave to God. I thank you. I'm not like this, this, and this. It's kind of similar to what Jesus is saying here. Yeah. And it's just all these I've kept since I was a little boy. So he's even saying like, I've been keeping these perfectly and continually. And so what Jesus is going to do next is to help him see, no, no, you haven't. And he loves him. This is one of the the most beautiful verses in the Bible where Jesus looks at him and loves him. Why did Jesus look at him and love him? It's such an important setup because what he says next is it hurts. It is not going to make him happy and it isn't a direct answer, but Jesus loves this soul. Yeah. And, you know, if we were to look at someone like this today, there's someone that is interested and invested in spiritual things. There's someone that actually cares about eternal life, which stands in stark contrast to those that don't, obviously. This man wants what Jesus has to give. He simply doesn't understand that all of the work that he's doing trying to get it is actually preventing him from simply receiving it by faith. So why did Jesus... Uh answer like this, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Why didn't he just say, believe in me and not as your savior? Yeah, this, this man needed to be brought to a further place of realization that he is a sinner. This is one of the applications that our, our team made when we went through this as a Bible study is sometimes we as Christian witnesses need to just keep keep speaking the law, keep speaking the law in truth and in love to help people see that they're a sinner until someone is well aware that they are not capable of pulling themselves up by their spiritual boot straps, but they are in dire need of rescue. They aren't ready to hear about a perfect savior from sin if they don't think they have sin. So Jesus just keeps hammering at that. So when Jesus is saying this, he's saying, you don't love your neighbor as yourself because, look, there's more you can do. Yeah, he's, he's giving him a very specific example of something that this man has a problem with, mm-hmm. and that's his, his love of physical possessions. And he's really, Jesus is just using this, not, not to say that, like, wealth is the big sin of the Bible, but just to say, like, this man, this was going to be a very obvious problem he had. So the little bit of research I did um, showed me that our LDS friends are going to interpret this very, very differently. Um, can you summarize what you learned? Yeah, so they're, they're going to focus more on that this man did lack one thing. Um, there's a number of general conference talks um, that focus on this, and one of the titles of them is What Lack I? And it really goes into this idea that maybe all of us is lacking one thing that will prevent us from earning or doing what is necessary to earn eternal life. And so to really do a introspective look at yourself and say, which of the commandments am I not keeping? Maybe even some of the things like 
compassion or love or taking care of my neighbor, you know, simple things like that, seemingly simple, which of those things is preventing you? That, uh, when, as I thought about that more, the one I caught my eye was uh, stop complaining. Like this woman had been convicted, like, oh, I should stop complaining. That's the thing I lack. Uh, but as I try to put myself in those shoes, like what lack I? Like, well, I can always give up one more minute of my time. I can always sleep less. I can always give more of my money. There's always more to give. How could I ever feel confident that I lack nothing? And so that, you know, it throws me into that, the seat of terror in of, I can't save myself. And that's the point that Jesus wanted him to bring to, bring him to. But as we see, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And that, that's really where the story ends. The Mormon commentators like to say that he went and he sold all his possessions and then he followed Jesus. And I say, show me in scripture where it says that. And they can't show us. So after he left, the story continues. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he acknowledges it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And this is when he gives that really short parable of sorts where he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Have you ever tried to put a, a camel through the eye of a needle, Molly? I haven't. <laughs> it's hard enough getting a thread through the eye of a needle. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, and just that it's kind of a ridiculous parable, but just that this is impossible. Um, you can't save yourself. You can't inherit heaven by doing more things, doing the right things. You can't do it. You're not good. Yeah, and what one caution maybe here is to apply this only to wealthy or, or rich people. Mm -hmm. Jesus that's not the point he's making. He's not saying it's impossible for rich people. to. He's saying it's impossible for anyone based on what they're trying to do. And that's when the disciples get it. And they say, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And this is really the like mic drop moment <laughs> of this story where he's really just saying like, this is not the point, guys. This is the true point. Jesus is the true point. Mm -hmm. And I think it really points back to the setup of the parable. Or it's not, not the parable, the whole story of uh, no one is good except God alone. The only reason we can have confidence that we will inherit eternal life is because we have faith in the one who is good, the one who is good for us, and the one who was willing to give up everything, who gave up heaven, came down to earth, and gave up his life. He's the reason that we have assurance in our eternal life. Yeah. So Peter says, hey, we left everything to follow you. Um, and I don't know if he's like uh, saying, getting a pat on the back, or if he's just saying, can we talk a little more about this? Because this is interesting. Yeah, or about the things <laughs> that we've lost here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, show, show, us, show us again that this is worth it. And this, over the last couple of weeks, has been become a verse that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about. I recently spent time with a ex-Mormon Christian friend who was telling me that she found great comfort in this verse as she was leaving Mormonism for Jesus. She lost a lot of things, including really her home, her family, um, in a sense, her livelihood. And she now says, like, this verse tells her that God's going to take care of me. And he has provided her with new family, not a physical family as much, but a spiritual family. And she just takes great comfort that God is working in this too, even in these, mm -hmm. these persecutions in her life. It's so beautiful that God to know that God sees you and he's got something better in mind for you. As much as it hurts to lose your earthly relationships, he's got something better for you. Yeah, that friend also was really drawn to the the next verses that they're kind of, they seem short and like a an unnecessary interlude in all of these different stories that are going on. 
But each of the gospel, the synoptic gospel writers here includes Jesus predicting his death for the third time. And really what he's saying is like, we're going to go to Jerusalem, boys, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. He says this for the third time so that they don't miss it. And yet they do. And yet we do too. And I think that's one of the things that just in all of this, Jesus is saying, it's not about this. It's not about your work. It's about my death. It's about my resurrection. That's the thing that's going to make you righteous with God. It is very specific to uh, mock, spit, flogged, kill, rise from the dead. And that just fascinates me how specific it is. And then even... A few verses down, verse 45, he gives this very direct purpose. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I just think that's an interesting verse to ponder. What does it mean that Jesus is giving his life as a ransom? So the next verse is, is about the blind receiving sight, which has happened multiple times, especially in Mark. Um but it parallels our other stories about blind and sight quite a bit. Yeah, so be, picking up with verse 36 or 46, Mark says, Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This is the, the more traditional way of asking for mercy, but he's also acknowledging his need. He's also acknowledging the fact that there's nothing that he can do to make himself right. Uh, many, however, rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. What strikes me so much is just the have mercy on me that theme and how if you approach Jesus with your ego, if you approach Jesus with uh, the law of Moses, uh, you know, he'll, he'll help you learn something. He might uh, give you some law that hurts. But if you approach Jesus by saying, have mercy on me, he stops, he acknowledges you, and he has mercy. Like he never, I mean, and now I'm starting to underline have mercy on me in all of the gospel accounts just to see. And he never denies anyone mercy. Yeah. And what they really see about Jesus is that he is able to provide something that they're lacking. And in this case, it's physical sight. And really throughout these chapters we've been seeing the need for spiritual sight and that need for spiritual sight is even more difficult um, many times we are unwilling to admit that we are blinded by our sin and unbelief and therefore unwilling to cry out lord have mercy on me and that's that's really what jesus is trying to lead people to see in all of these stories We've got one more story that we're going to look at today, and it's a final parable that is unique to Matthew's account. So in Matthew chapter 20, beginning with verse 1, there is the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And again, think about this in the context of all of the other stories that we've looked at so far today of, of this, this contrast between righteousness, of self-righteousness and humility, between pride and humility, and the man's desire to do the work and God's desire to give his grace. Molly, would you read that for us? Matthew 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them to his vineyard. 
About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat all day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who is hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do with what I want with that? Do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. So before we dive into the meaning, is there some cultural background that would be helpful to know for this parable? Yeah, maybe just the idea that there were day laborers. Um, This was a fairly common thing. If someone didn't have their own land and they were looking for seasonal work, they would show up at a specific location where they knew that landowners would come and look for people to work during the day. Um, Normally, you worked for the whole day, though. And that was one of the things that's unique about this. I, I, I was trying to think about, you know, if Jesus was around today and he was putting this parable into more modern context, Um, maybe he would use, you know, a big corporation or company and he'd talk about someone that has put in 40 years and is vested in the company, is ready for retirement. They've done all of it. They've been around since the beginning and people that came along 10, 15, 20 years later, somebody that is interning, someone that is there doing temp work just for a couple of days and all of them are receiving the full inheritance the full or the the full salary and the full benefit package and that would be preposterous to us today too okay that helps to see how absurd the story is so i guess knowing that how would you summarize just the general main point what is jesus getting at yeah he one more time is challenging us um he's challenging our natural sense of fairness and justice Uh, We expect the workers who labored longer to get a greater reward. But in the parable, all of the workers receive the same thing. And really what Jesus is helping us see is that it's not about you. It's not about you working to receive the kingdom of God. It's about a gracious God who gives. Um, It's a powerful reminder of this radical nature of God's grace and the way it challenges our human concepts of justice and, and fairness. We, we don't want grace that is free. We want it to have strings attached because then we can be the ones that control the strings and pull on the strings. And so I struggled with this one understanding it, but now I'm seeing that at the very end when he says, I want to give um, the same as I gave to you. And he talks about him being generous. This isn't about wages earned. This is about the gift of the landowner here. So LDS have very different interpretation of this, don't they? Help me be prepared, Mark. Yeah. So in some of their training materials for this, they really focus on that all of these people were working and working hard towards exaltation. They had to endure, in a sense, here to the end of the day. And they, they really build on this idea that each one of them had to work and endure to the end. And therefore, they received exaltation. They did say that there are no like deathbed confessions. That's, that's not going to work out. Um, instead, you've got to keep pushing on. And you need to endure to the very end of your life. But at some point, you need to start. 
and it's it's really putting again the the focus on the work of each individual rather than on the true work that the Bible talks about, which is to believe, to believe in the name of the one who could save. Mm-hmm. Oh, that reminds me of that passage from John. I gotta look that up. It's John six twenty eight and twenty nine. Then they asked him, that's Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Yeah, so it's not about our efforts. It's not about us enduring to the end. It's not about us putting in all of this commitment. It's about belief, trust in the perfect son of God. So as we're preparing to witness to our friends this week, in what ways would you focus on how man should not be elevated and how God should be? Yeah, I I think in all of these chapters, what the Holy Spirit is really helping us see is the nature of our our sin and ultimately the need of a Savior, Uh, not just someone that we can brush up against and say, hey, you're pretty good. Help me be good like you. But someone who was truly good, someone who was truly God, who came to do what we could never do. And just focus on those, point those in so many different directions just to acknowledge um, that we need that mercy, that we need that propitiation, God to come and atone to do a sacrifice that we are not able to perform for ourselves. And I think this is one of those weeks where I would just acknowledge how hard this is, how many times we too fall into the pharisaical attitude of comparing ourselves with people or saying to ourselves, well, I am more loved by God or I'm earning more from God because of this, this, or this, you know, examples I was thinking of myself is, well, I belong to the right denomination. I follow the right doctrines or I have the right creeds or I participate in the right kind of worship services. All of these things that are not the gospel, Mm -hmm. all of these things that are not really what brings me into a relationship with God. And sometimes I, I boast in those, or I, I pride myself in those, even if it's not outwardly, inwardly, I know I do. And as soon as you notice that pride, you can cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yep. Will you pray for our witnessing friends? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today like that tax collector, well aware of our sinfulness and our need for a Savior and his perfect atonement. Have mercy on us, Lord, um, first individually, but then have mercy on all of our Mormon friends, family, and those missionaries. Um, Help us to have the same heart of love and the heart of compassion that Jesus did for that rich young man, where we we look at them and, and we love them, but also that we would look at them and love them enough to share hard hitting messages of law and then seek every opportunity to point them to your perfect work accomplished on the cross. Uh, We ask that you would crush our self-righteousness and then build us back up with the gospel, um, the encouragement in that great gift that you have given to us through faith. I ask that you would be with us this day and always as you build your kingdom here on earth um, and use us as your simple tools, as links in a chain to go and reach those that don't yet know you as their Lord and Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth in love ministry podcast. For more resources, visit tilm.org. If this podcast and other truth in love ministry resources have been a blessing to you, Consider supporting the mission to proclaim Christ to Mormons and empower Christians to witness by visiting tilm.org backslash 